Good morning, folks. Hope everybody's having a good morning. It's good to see you all here. And, uh, without any further ado, let's stand up and begin worshiping our Savior and our God. <laughs> We're going to do our call to worship this morning. <laughs> it's found in Matthew um, chapter, I believe it's 1, verses 22 through 23. It says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us.
You all can grab a seat. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Winthrop Street Baptist Church. My name is Grant. I am one of the pastors here. It's so good to be with you all this morning, worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, together. Amen. 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 A few brief announcements for us this morning. Uh, number one is our Christmas Eve service is right around the corner. Uh, so December 24th, Saturday this year at 5 p.m., right here. So we'll be singing some songs and worshiping our Lord. So invite your friends, invite family. It's a great time to come and worship together. There's invitations on the back table there if you'd like to invite some of your friends, family, co-workers. Uh, what a great opportunity to welcome people in this time of year. And Christmas morning as well, the next day, uh, right here at 1030. Two more announcements. The first one here is on in your bulletin is every Sunday morning at 930. There's a handful of us praying in the, the back in the children's church. You're more than welcome to come and join uh, for just an informal time of prayer for our worship service this morning or for just needs going on in our church family. And the lastly, it's not on here, but community group is continuing to go. So if you have any interest in joining that, we meet on a weekly basis. It's been a great time. I heard this morning that we had 18 people and 10, 18 adults and 10 kids. So it was, it was a packed house. It was a great time and God's doing a great work there. So if you're interested in joining that, please reach out to me. Let me know. It's a great way to really just start to connect and get to know people in the church as well. Great place to invite friends and family also. Now, with that all being said, we are continuing in the Gospel of Mark. So if you are reading in the uh, Bibles underneath the chairs in front of you, that's page 837. Page 837 should also be on the screen for you as well. And this morning we are in Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 45. So that's Mark 1, page 837, verses 40 to 45. <clears throat> Let's read God's Word together. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once, and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go. Show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out, began to talk freely about it, and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. This is God's word. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your gospel. God, thank you for the joy it is to read your word, to sing your word, to hear your word preached, to fellowship together. God, it is good to be together. Lord, how good and pleasant it is when, when brethren dwell in unity. It's a good day. It's a good day to worship you despite the brokenness and sin-riddled world that we live in. Lord, we are thankful for rest and rejoicing in you, our Lord. God, we pray for uh, people, family, brothers and sisters in our congregation who are sick, struggling physically. Lord, we specifically think of, of Vincent. God, thank you for him and uh, Lord for the, the progress he's making, Lord, and, and thank you, God, that uh, he's continuing to, to rely on you and, and remember you, oh God. We pray for just continued blessing and healing for him, and Lord, that his reliance will continue to be on you. God, we pray for Andy and for uh, him and his recovery home, and, and him and Diane. God, we pray for uh, just continued uh, progress there. And Lord, we, we thank you that he's home and pray that he just continue to make steps in recovery while reliance on you and uh, God we pray for, for brother Paul and, and just the, the most recent 
uh, news and struggles there. God, we pray for healing for him and wisdom for, for him and, and his doctors and everyone surrounding him. God, we pray for many others that uh, may be struggling with colds and RSV and COVID and just all the things going around. God, we uh, pray just for your relief, your healing hand, but we also pray, God, uh, that we won't let any of these things be distractions ultimately from you. Uh, so, God, we do. We pray for uh, this Christmas season that our eyes will uh, not be so distracted by presents and gifts and food and celebrating that we forget the ultimate reason that all of this is happening, and it's you, Christ. Um, so, God, we pray that in the midst of fun and maybe stress and excitement and all the, the emotions and flurries these next couple weeks are going to bring for many of us, we pray, God, that it will ultimately draw us closer to you. Lord, that we will lean on you and your strength for encouragement, Lord, and that we will be bold and courageous for your name's sake as we encounter many people uh, with work parties, with family coming into town, with us going to family uh, and friends and just people we don't often get to see. God, we pray that if fellow believers, we can be just a, a rich encouragement for them. And God, for uh, those that don't know you yet, God, we pray that they will and that our witness and testimony can be a small moment that you use for your glory and for their good. God, we do also pray for uh, churches in our community. God, as we're nearing Christmas and it's one of the busiest times of year for people to come out to church. God, we pray and beg you that the city of Taunton and our surrounding towns and, and neighborhoods, Lord, will have churches proclaiming Christ crucified. It's not about Winthrop Street. It's about you, Lord. So we pray, God, for us as well as for many other churches in our area that your gospel will go forward and that we will see revival for the name of Jesus Christ in our city and in Massachusetts and all over the world. We love you, God. Thank you for the victory that we have in Jesus. We praise you, Father, for the gift of grace in him. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, let's stand and continue our worship in our singing of the doxology. Praise God. Kids, uh, kindergarten to fifth, fifth grade can be dismissed to the children's church. And uh, if you have your Bibles open, let's turn to Mark chapter 1. And we're going to finish up Mark's, or chapter 1 of Mark uh, today. We'll look at this short little uh, story. And stories are good, aren't they? Stories are passed down through the history of culture to tell something to us, to teach something to us. So let's take, for example, Charlie Brown's Christmas special. Many of you have seen Charlie Brown. I think all of us have probably seen Charlie's, Charlie Brown's Christmas special. Well, sadly, this year is the last year that it's going to be on network TV, and then you have to have Apple TV or Apple Plus or whatever to watch it from here on out. Now, the premise of the story is that Charlie Brown wants to understand the true meaning of Christmas. And I think that the peak of this story is when Linus gets up on the stage. And what does he do? He recites Luke chapter 2. And as he's reciting beautifully at this point, when he says, when Linus says that the angel said, fear not, does anyone notice what Linus did? He dropped his blanket. And if you're familiar with the Charlie Brown Christmas story, that Linus takes that blanket everywhere. And so that that scene, that instance, is teaching us something. That small detail shows us something true. It teaches us 
that lioness no longer needs the, the blanket. He doesn't need the comfort or the security of it because Jesus is now here and there's nothing to fear. It's by the coming of Jesus that our fears are relieved and salvation from sin has come. And after that, Linus famously walks off the stage. And what does he say to Charlie Brown? That's the true meaning. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Now, I don't want to preach a sermon on Charlie Brown Christmas special, but I use that example to show that a story can teach us something incredibly valuable. And as we're finishing Mark chapter 1, I want to remind us again of the main theme of the book that comes in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. It says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And this verse highlights the two main themes of the book. First, Christ's service, which is most of Mark's gospel. And second, Christ's sacrifice, which ends the book. And when we look at the entirety of the book of Mark, we find that it's, it's mainly a book of miracles, if we look at it. There's not a lot of red letters in Mark's gospel. But that doesn't mean that Mark's gospel isn't filled with teaching. Instead, what we find is that the miracles of Mark's gospel teach us something explicitly and plainly. They're, they're parables that visually teach us about the effect of God's work through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit as Jesus lived among mankind. And so we'll look at these miracles in the coming weeks as we study Mark, and we'll see Jesus heal the blind man, which reveals that he can illuminate a dark heart, that Jesus calms the storm to show his power over all things, and that Jesus brings peace to troubled hearts. We see Jesus raise the dead to proclaim his life-giving power. So we can see that these miracles are actually parables. And that's what we're going to see this, this morning. So Mark is a very spiritual book, and it teaches us amazing truth about Jesus. So in this passage that we come to this morning, this parable teaches us something far beyond the surface. Mark 1, 40-45 teaches us that Jesus is the perfect substitute who removes our sin by his perfect holiness. And today we'll see that Jesus is perfectly holy and he's the perfect substitute to his people. So the first point is that Jesus is perfectly holy. And so now we know that Christ's miracles in Mark really serve as a teaching to us. So it's kind of been prepared for us. Now we have to establish what the leprosy in this passage really means and what it's really talking about. Well, in this passage... Leprosy is symbolic for sin. And the healing that Jesus provides is a parable about the deliverance from sin. So the word for leprosy, it, it covered a broad number of skin diseases that were difficult to diagnose and difficult to heal. Now today, it's a very rare disease. It's called Hansen's disease, which is actually treatable. But a person with leprosy in the first century was made fun of and shunned from society. The leper was made to wear clothes that were torn. They were told to leave their hair messy, to cover their face, and to cry out, unclean, unclean, when people came near to them so that the leprosy wouldn't spread. A leper was made to live in isolation, and Jewish, Jewish historians said that there was no difference between a leper and a corpse. Leviticus 13 and 14 describe leprosy in depth. Leprosy was seen as evidence of punishment from God, which means that the cure can only come from God. So leprosy had to be healed and, ha and required cl cleansing as well. And obviously, no one else in the Bible could heal a leper with a single touch other than Jesus. Leviticus 13 shows that leprosy is a lot like sin. Leprosy is deeper than the skin. Leprosy spreads. Leprosy defiles. It isolates and contaminates. Leprosy starts small, progresses slowly, and it's totally destructive, and it can bring death. And isn't that what sin is like? 
So leprosy is a picture of sin. It's a symbol of our moral depravity. And anyone who doesn't trust in Jesus is spiritually in worse shape than this leper was physically. That's the reality of the situation. That apart from the work of Christ, we would be like decaying forms of walking death. So let's dive into this parable that teaches us some amazing spiritual truth. So we've seen that the ministry of of Jesus has spread throughout all of Galilee. That Jesus preaches the gospel of God's gracious kingdom, and yet he's interrupted. Look at verse 40. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. So the news of the power of Jesus had, had spread and reached the leper colony. This isolated place filled with hurting and broken people. And these people have been through a lot, haven't they? So just imagine their situation. One day they woke up and noticed something on their skin. Knowing their culture, what they probably tried to do was cover it up as long as they could because they knew how scary of a situation it was. That if, if, and if they were Jews, these people would have to go to the priest, who would be the medical expert of the day, to diagnose what was a normal skin issue or the dreaded leprosy. If it was leprosy, then this person would be deemed unclean and would be cast out of the society and the covenant community. They would have to leave their home, their family, their community, and their place to worship. They would live alone and only interact with others who were infected with leprosy. And if they were approached by, an un, uh, by a healthy person, they would have to call out, unclean, unclean, so that the leprosy would not infect more people. So the leper was the ultimate outsider in Israel. But look at verse 40 again. It says that a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling. So this leper violated every convention and custom in the society. But he was so desperate, and the faint whisper of healing fueled this man's hope so much that he would come to Jesus, and he knelt, and he begged, and he said, If you will, you can make me clean. And isn't that in itself an amazing statement of faith? It wasn't whether Jesus could heal him. It was if Jesus would heal him. So we actually get more details about this story from the other gospel accounts. Luke chapter 5 says that this man pushed his way through an amazed crowd. And he laid down his, his mass of rotting flesh before Jesus because his body was full of leprosy. So the disease had run its course throughout his body. So you can just, you can just kind of picture this scene. And if you've ever seen a picture of someone who has leprosy, one picture is enough. You won't want to see it again. Because the issue behind leprosy is that there's the sense of pain is destroyed. So the disease brings numbness to the extremities and to the eyes and ears and nose. And so the disfigurement comes from being unable to feel things. So you can burn your hands, you can wash your face with hot water, and it can cause problems. And in third world countries, there's vermin that sometimes chew on sleeping lepers. And a doctor that has performed many surgeries on lepers would send a cat home with them as normal post-op procedure. You get the sense of what the cat is going to do, right? Protect the, lep- the, the healing person and healing wounds from, yeah, being chewed on. <laughs> Not to get gross. but So leprosy is like a painless hell, really. And this poor man had not been able to feel for years. His body was full of leprosy, rotting, stinking, and repulsive flesh. Combine that, combine his physical condition with his psyche of being cast out of society for years meant that this man was in absolute desperation. He was humiliated, he was isolated, because they all thought that it was highly contagious, which leprosy is actually not. So think about how you would feel if you were this man, calling out unclean, looking like a complete mess, 
being unable to feel anything, how would you view yourself? You'd likely view yourself as worthless. You'd probably be in complete despair. And for years, this is what he probably believed since it was reinforced by the society that he lived in. The leper had long viewed his life as dead with an irreversible condition, and the society essentially treated him like a dead man. And isn't that the spiritual condition for all of us? That we are all spiritual lepers? But we're not like the leper because so often we're unaware of the pervasiveness of our sinful condition, right? And the less that we know about the sin in our hearts, the more full-blown is the state of our spiritual leprosy. If we can say, hey, I'm good with God, while ignoring the spiritual death in our heart, then what does that say about our souls? Our souls are on the verge of spiritual destruction. And so we all need to realize that sin is an issue that we cannot correct by ourselves. We can't do it on our own. Because it's, it's far worse than we could have ever imagined. And you know, we need to really feel this. Because it's not just that we sin, it's that our whole nature is wrong. Our whole nature is corrupted. And if you don't feel that, if you don't get that sense, then you'll never feel the need of a savior. And Christmas will mean nothing to you. It'll just be getting stuff and toys and hanging out with family and friends. But when you get that, and it happens by faith, then life, your life will change forever. And that's what happens to this leper. It happened by faith. Because what did he do? He had confidence in Jesus. Remember what he said? If you will, you can make me clean. The leper believed that Jesus could cure him. He thought, well, if Jesus can help others, then he can cure me. You know, the leper had a sense of caution because he knew that Christ could heal him, but would Christ heal him? Would it happen? And the difference between us and the leper is this. We don't need to have any hesitation. Because we know the gospel, and because we know the heart of Jesus, he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom. And healing this leper will fulfill the exact purpose of Jesus. The leper was in a hopeless condition, but he believed in Jesus and cried out to Christ to heal him. And in the same way, we must come to Jesus just like the leper, even though that we are sinfully sick sinners. We must come to Jesus believing that Jesus is the only one who can change our lives and who can make us whole again. And so this man goes against convention. He dares to come to Jesus with a statement of faith in the power of Jesus, knowing and hoping that Jesus would actually bring healing to him. How is Jesus going to respond? What is he going to do? I mean, any good Jewish rabbi would never risk being this close to a leper. They wouldn't want to become unclean. But what will Christ do? Look at verse 41. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Isn't that amazing? Jesus makes the unclean clean. He didn't turn away from the man, but instead Jesus reached out towards the man. He was moved with compassion and he touches him. Now Jesus here went went beyond pity. It's more than just pity or sympathy or empathy. Jesus had like a a gut-wrenching compassion for him. You know, I think this is the type of feeling that we understand when we have a sick family member or friend, or child, you know, we say, oh man, I wish I could be sick instead of them. And that's a picture of the heart of our God and Savior, isn't it? That when Jesus touched the man, the curse of leprosy was immediately lifted 
At that instant, the man was clean. And years of public shame were gone. His physical ailments were healed instantly. The healing was immediate and it was total. His toeless feet became whole. His hands grew fingers before his very eyes. The hair on his head came back. His nose and his ears grew back, and the skin on his body became soft and free from disease. So can you imagine the reaction from the crowd? I mean, you can just picture this scene. The man was being remade as Jesus touched him. And instead of crying out, unclean, he said, I'm clean, I'm clean. Just This is an amazing scene, and this is what Jesus has done for you and for me. Instant cleansing. Permanent salvation from sin because it's by the blood of Jesus that we are cleansed. So our confidence rests upon Jesus Christ. When we looked back at, when we started Mark, we saw in Mark chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, that Mark established Jesus as this kingly suffering servant. The suffering servant from Isaiah 53 And now we have a story that's teaching us an important truth about Jesus. Remember that familiar verse in Isaiah 53? Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. So in this scene, in this story, which is a parable for us, Jesus took on himself the sickness of this leper. And he cleanses him and makes him whole. And isn't it amazing and remarkable to think that Jesus is the suffering servant who has compassion for our hearts that are filled with the leprosy of sin. And it's on the cross that Jesus actually felt the weight of our sins. He felt the punishment for our sins. On the cross, Jesus bore the grief of our sin, and carried the sorrow for our sin. So Jesus has cleansed and healed us just like he cleansed this leper. What wonderful grace God gives to those who believe in him, right? I mean, look. Look at how Jesus healed him. It's with a touch. He he stretched out his hand and he touched him. He He didn't cower in fear. He didn't run away. And I just imagine, trying to picture this story, that Jesus touched the most defiled part of this leper's body, where the the leprosy was the worst. I, I just assume, maybe I'm wrong, that Jesus touched the worst part of his body. And this touch is important. You know, we've we've already seen Jesus take the hand of Peter's mother-in-law by touching her, he healed her. And this theme continues and runs throughout Mark's gospel, that the touch of Jesus brings supernatural life. And Jesus didn't need to touch anyone, right? He he could have just said the word and healed these people. But he wanted to. He touched these people because he wanted to, and touch is important. It's a natural way to share emotion to share concern, to share love toward another person. And so we see, even in the events of the actions of Jesus, it portrays his divinity and it portrays his humanity. This man, being full of leprosy, hadn't been touched by anyone in years. So if he was married, he had not touched his wife, or embraced her for a long, long time. If he had children, there was no kiss, no touch for years, and maybe they were now adults. For years, he longed to be touched. Just think of the the desperate loneliness this man felt. And Jesus extended his hand and touched him. He firmly placed his hand on this leper, And you can only imagine the amazement that coursed through his body as the leper felt the divine power of Jesus that brought him complete healing 
and restoration to his body. Just imagine that. You know, the, the crowds, the people were shocked. The disciples didn't have words. Just this, this touch of Jesus, you know, I'm, I'm sensing that there's probably a lot of people here that would be like, man, if Jesus would just touch me and cleanse me, get rid of this physical ailment, get rid of this situation, just the touch of Jesus would do wonders. And sometimes in this life, we have to realize that, that the physical ailments that we have are ways of God to to show his glory in our heart and in our lives, even as difficult as it is. We trust Jesus can heal us, but sometimes he doesn't. We don't understand his ways and his purposes, and yet we live a life of faith, trusting in Jesus, knowing his grace for us and his goodness toward us. And so even in the physical ailments that we experience or the confusion of life, we continue to trust in Christ, knowing that he's with us. He identifies with us. So the people in the crowds were shocked, and the touch of Jesus was met with this response where he says, I will be clean. Unlike any ordinary man, Jesus was not polluted by the leper's disease. Jesus didn't need to worry about being ceremonially unclean. The people in the crowd worried for Jesus to be that way, but Jesus knew he was not. Because what happened was, the leper is cleansed by the gracious touch of the contagious holiness of Jesus. Jesus was not stained or contaminated by this leper. Instead, it was the opposite. The holiness of Christ pervaded this man's life so that he would be able to know and trust and follow God. Think of it this way, too. What do we do at Christmas? We're celebrating the incarnation. We're celebrating the coming of Christ and the touch of Jesus. To this leper shows us that Jesus had a physical body, right? And it says to the leper, I'm with you. I understand you. And I love you. So Jesus took his his pure hand and placed it on the rotting flesh of the leper, and what a wonderful parable of the incarnation it is to us. The incarnation when Jesus took on human flesh in order to live the perfect life and to become sin for us so that we can get his perfect holiness and purity and his righteousness. It's called The Great Exchange by Martin Luther. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so on the cross, what happens? There's a great exchange. We give Christ our sins. He takes our sins and gives us his righteousness. It's a beautiful exchange. And on the cross, it's as if Jesus touched our flesh and healed us by his perfect holiness, by his perfect righteousness. So that when we see Jesus reach down to touch this leper and place his holy hand on the decaying, rotting, foul-smelling flesh of the leper, we see what he did for him, and more importantly, we also see what he has done for us. He has removed our sin. He has healed us spiritually. He has cleansed us by his perfect holiness, and he does so by faith. We have faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ, and we're saved by that wonderful sovereign grace of God in Jesus. But Jesus isn't done caring for this man. Look at what happens next. Look at verse 43. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for yourself cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. So the only way that this man could be reinstated back into society was to go be examined again by the priest so that he could be ceremonially clean in order to be socially restored. Jesus wants the man to go to the priest not only as obedience to the law, but also as a witness to the priest about the power of Jesus, as verse 44 says, for a proof to them. Leviticus chapter 14, 
which is, I know, I am fully aware, is many of your favorite chapters in the Bible. Leviticus 14 details the offerings that must be made in order for someone to be cleansed from leprosy. Again, wonderful devotional material for you. But we know all of God's word is profitable, right? So we'll talk about it now. So that it, Leviticus 14 says that these offerings involve birds and grains, which would be symbolically sacrificed as a means to portray cleansing. First, from the leprosy, which, provi- which would provide this ceremonial cleansing necessary for this leper. And then after eight days, after the cleansing and washing, the former leper could now come into the tabernacle and he would make offerings for his sin. They would, and for that offering, they would take two male lambs without blemish and a ewe lamb to be provided as a sacrifice for the guilt offering of their sin. And the blood of those lambs would be taken and placed on their right ear, on their right thumb, and on their right big toe of the cleansed person, just as what was done with the consecration of priests. And what the priest would do is, the priest after that would make atonement for the sins of the man before the Lord. And if the cleansed leper was poor, God made a way for that man. There were special provisions for the poor in Israel to be able to make these sacrifices to the Lord. Isn't it amazing? God doesn't discriminate based on socioeconomic status. And for us now today, we don't have leprosy, hopefully, right? I don't know. Hopefully you don't have leprosy. If you do, I don't want to see it. We don't have lambs. We don't have birds. But we know that through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the entire Old Testament sacrificial system was fulfilled. Hebrews chapter 10 says that it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So the cleansing that we need from our sin comes to us through the death of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away sin and whose blood paid the price for the sins of those who would come to believe in him. How amazing is that? Praise God for the effective sacrifice of Jesus to give salvation and redemption to us who believe in him. Amen? So we see this this perfect holiness of Christ, and now as we come to the end here, we see the perfect substitute in Jesus. So in Jesus, we have the perfect substitute, and we get a glimpse of, of this within the story of the leper being cleansed. Jesus told the man to go to the temple, don't say anything to anyone, just like he tells the demons last week we saw not to speak so that they don't gain spiritual power from speaking. He tells the disciples not to speak because they're confused about the identity of Jesus. And here, it's kind of pragmatic. He tells the healed man not to speak so that Jesus would be able to kind of have mobility in society so that he'd be able to move freely and openly without causing a complete uproar. And because Jesus doesn't want people who come to him just for the miracles. He wants, or he doesn't want the people just to come and see something cool. Jesus wants people who will truly follow him, who want truth, and who want to know Christ. Jesus doesn't want people to come to him just to get what they want. Instead, he wants people to come to him for him. Amen? But look at what this man does. He doesn't shut up. He keeps talking. Look at verse 45. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. You kind of understand why the leper disobeys, right? The leper left the presence of Jesus, and he went out and told everyone what Jesus had done. 
and you can get the excitement. He, he essentially found a new lease on life. He, and he's, he's got a new life. He's not dead anymore. He's healed. He's restored. He's joyful. He's, he's praising God. But he disregarded the clear command of Jesus. And he, he told everyone. And look at the effect that it had on the preaching ministry of Jesus. He could, quote, no longer openly enter a town. So now look at where Jesus is. Jesus is left to the desolate places. And yet even with that, the people still come from everywhere to find him. So at the start of the passage, what did we see? We had a leper who was the outcast, who was living in the lonely, desolate places in the leper colony, come to Jesus, and look at what happens now. Jesus is now in the desolate places. Jesus and the leper have swapped locations. Isn't that crazy to see? The leper is on the inside of the community with his family and friends, while Jesus is on the outside in the lonely, desolate place, unable to even enter into a town. And that's a picture of substitution. This is the heart of the gospel, that Jesus took our place. He's substituted. He's our great substitute. This, this is why Jesus came to earth. He came to take on himself our sin, our sorrow, our shame, and in exchange, what does Jesus give to us? Forgiveness, his holiness, acceptance, and his righteousness. Praise God for that amazing exchange. And praise is the natural response of true believers. And this is what we celebrate at Christmas each year, that the coming of Jesus Christ to bring his forgiveness, his redemption, and the life of salvation to the world. This is why we sing of the wonderful grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that his grace is far greater than all of our sins. So if you have yet to come to believe in Jesus Christ, and you're here this morning, let me encourage you, trust in him right now. There's no reason to not. Take hold of Jesus and you will immediately be healed from the worst disease corrupting mankind, which is sin. Can you humble yourself to say, Jesus, I know you're willing. Take my sin away. If you do it right now, you'll experience the salvation of God. And this is what we live for. We live for God, his glory, and to know him and to enjoy him for the rest of our lives and into eternity. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you and praise you that you are our perfect substitute from heaven. That you, by your grace, for our good and for your glory, came to earth, that you humbled yourself to become obedient to death, even death on a cross. We thank you that this is what Christmas highlights, that you came from heaven to live that perfect life, to die that substitutionary death, to rise again to give us newness of life so that we would know you and enjoy you forever and ever. It's to you and your glorious name that we pray. Amen. and join us as we sing our last song, Grace Greater Than Our Sin.
how great you are, that your grace overcomes even our sin, our struggles, our rebellion, and still you still have it today, that God, you are greater than that. I pray, God, that today we all will be led to repent and faith in Christ, whether for the first time for this thousand years of coming before you in remembrance. Praise